Welcome everyone to New York Buddha Dharma. And um, the subject for tonight is the painful bardo of dying. It's called the Chikai bardo. Um, <coughs> my voice is hoarse. This is the first real bardo of death. Actually, it's not the bardo of death. Sometimes it's classed as one of the death bardos, and sometimes it's not, because it's the bardo in which we actually die. This is the bardo or interval. That's what bardo means, interval, from to bardo um, in Tibetan. and. Um, it's the interval which begins when you contract the condition that is going to kill you, and it ends with your death. Um, there are basically two parts to this bardo. The first is the death of the physical body. And when that is concluded, um, that's the point at which Western medicine would generally pronounce a person dead. Their heart stops, brain activity flatlines, breathing stops. But from a Buddhist perspective, there's a little more to go. And what's more to go is the death of the subtle body, which includes the mind. Because the mind is still, the mind of the samsaric mind, is still um, alive and active. And that is dying as well. And when that finally dies, um, and there's a description of how that occurs, then we actually uh, are, have achieved death. Now, um, it's a strange and bizarre coincidence, or maybe it's not so strange and bizarre, but it is a coincidence that in the course of teaching this, I taught it recently up in Westchester, and we've just finished it uh, before the Christmas break, and now here, two friends have died suddenly. In Westchester, a woman named uh, Ruhama Schechter, uh, and I think I've told you this, she was part of the class and other classes at the Buddhist Center. She's an Israeli um, and uh, was an artist, very talented, won awards. She also taught small children art, uh, very alive, two daughters, grown, husband. And um, about a month or more ago, she contracted the flu on a Saturday. Sunday, it got worse. Monday, her husband was taking her to the doctor, and she died in the car. He took her to the hospital. They managed to get her breathing and her heart going again, but she was brain dead. And so they let her pass. Um, amazingly sudden. Out of nowhere, she's 63, 64. And um, we did a Sukhavati for her the next week. I learned, learned her death five minutes before the second to the last class. Uh, on the death in the Bardos. And so I went and gave that. Um, that was on the Bardo of reality. Now, unless you have practiced an, a lot and achieved some degree of realization in your lifetime, you won't even see the Bardo of reality. It just goes by in a finger snap because you don't recognize it. If you've practiced enough, you will recognize it and then that can be quite an opportunity. But if you haven't, and probably Romy hadn't, I mean, she went by Romy a lot, uh, then you go straight into the bardo of becoming, which we're going to get to. And that is the classic 49-day period that perhaps you've heard of, that when a person dies, they move through everything very rapidly, and then suddenly they're in this 49-day period. That's the bardo of becoming, in which you are going to um, move towards your rebirth. And there's a description of what happens in the Bardo of Becoming. It can be quite 
challenging, to say the least. It's sort of like being in a very tumultuous dream state. And the next week at class, we conducted a Sukhavati, that's a Buddhist funeral uh, for Rami, just before the class. And the irony is that the class was on the Bardo of Becoming, which was precisely where Romy was. You know, if, if unless, you know, the best guess is that that's where she was in the Bardo of Becoming, and that's what the class was on. It's like I'm sending her a description of where she is and the instructions on how to navigate it, uh, you know, from the teachings. Really something. Now that was on December 17th, I think. On about um, somewhere around December 23rd, I received a communication um, from the ex-wife of a close friend of mine, a fellow named David Gurevich. And he had died quite suddenly the Friday before on the 20th. David um, he didn't come here and very much he came in the beginning but um, he was very interested in Buddhism and in the Shambhala teachings to some degree and in fact he donated the money for New York Buddha Dharma to be incorporated and he supplied the person very skilled person who we paid money to to get us our nonprofit status, which she did in an amazingly short time. And David provided that. He, so he was be our benefactor. Um, and what I've learned over the weeks since I learned of his death, David had a country place. I had dinner with him in um, the West Village about two weeks ago a little before the 20th. And he had a country place out in uh, Pennsylvania. He was a lawyer, and he was a criminal lawyer. Um, he met because he came to me for coaching. He was tired of working for the dark side and wanted to go over to the good guys again. He had been, been, he had been uh, a you know, employed in the DA's office for a while where you make bookus. You don't make any money there. Um, but he liked working for the good guys. And then he had gone over to the dark side, as he, as he put it, uh, because you need you make a lot of money, for, you know, defending white collar criminals, and as David said, he said, um, he said I know they're crooks, they know I know they're crooks, <laughs> but you know they're entitled to a defense, and he defended them, and he also did things like, um, just for kicks and grins, he went over to Tanzania to see if he could do anything to stop human trafficking. Now there's a, a thankless task and an impossible one. Um, the inertia there is just enormous. He said he had conversations with district attorneys and he'd be sitting there and there would be handlers in the room listening to make sure the DAs didn't say anything inappropriate because human trafficking is just rampant. And um, he did a bunch of things like that. He was a good guy. And then on the 20th, evidently, he was at his ho country home uh, went to sleep. The next morning, a friend arrived. She, she was due to come and pay him a visit to find the house burned to the ground. The best guess is that he got up in the middle of the night, put more logs on the fire, went back to sleep. The fire threw sparks, house went up, and he died, uh, perhaps of asphyxiation, and uh, the house was utterly destroyed. That's out in the country. And um, so I've been doing lots of tongue run for David. That's what you do uh, for people. I mean, I feel like I'm almost talking to him. You know, I mean, I just saw him for dinner recently. And um, we saw each other a couple times a month. We've become good friends. After I coached him for a while, we just became friends and had dinner several times a week, dinner, lunch. 
I mean a month. And I imagine him going to sleep and then waking up to find himself dead in the Varda. And how frightening that is, that could be, and freakish. And I've been thinking, you know, when you do Tonglen for a person, what you're doing is you're breathing in their suffering and you're sending out surcease from suffering, relief, you know. So you breathe in fear and unhappiness and you send out confidence, fearlessness, and cheer, all in the medium of the breath, right? This is, we know Tonglen. Give, sending, and taking, it's called. And it made me realize, to think that I was doing it for David, that what you're really breathing in is, no, I don't want to be here. This is horrible. What's happened to me? That state of mind. I'm all alone. Um, everything's taken away from me. This is awful. And you're sending out to him instead confidence, clarity, ease, the ability to rest where you are and be ready for the next thing, whatever it may be. They say in the teachings that people go into death, enlightened people, cheerfully, with curiosity, and good cheer. Hard to imagine when I think of David going to sleep in his country home and waking up all gone. Powerful. Powerful. So I would like to um, start doing Tong Lin here in the evenings when we do our meditation practice, not just sit, but do Tong Lin for people. And I think that for me, anyhow, because it's so immediate, and I'm hoping for you too, this imagining David and doing Tong Lin for him has really taught me what Tong Lin is truly about and also what it is that we all are working on. We are working on letting go of the complaint of the wishing things were otherwise, of being depressed because of our imaginings of what we've lost in the past, what the future holds, of letting all that go and resting in this present moment with clarity, delight, fearlessness, above all, above all, confidence. The term in Tibetan is ziji, and it's so important. It is the foundation of enlightened mind, confidence. Confidence is allows you to rest in this present moment without wanting things to be different and to be ready, ready at any moment to respond accurately and with compassion and, and uh, cheer to the world. You're in a constant dance, a dance with the world. They say that great enlightened people juggle the sun and moon. They're in constant play with the universe. The term is ropa which is usually translated as play. To be that kind of state of mind, rather than the mind of complaint and sorrow and fear. So tonight, I'm going to talk about part of the bardo of dying, sometimes called the painful bardo of dying. <laughs> Why is it painful? It's painful because we are caught up in wanting things to be the way we want them to be. And the painful bardo of dying takes everything from you. It takes the world. You know, you think it's think it's painful to lose your money, your loved ones, your lover, your youth. When you die, you lose the whole world, the universe, your body and all of it. And uh, it can be very painful if you're still attached to those things you're still holding on to them. Ah. So in the course of our lives,
lives as we're, as we're practitioners, we're working very hard to understand mind and reality, what they are. But in death, this arises much more easily. Because you see what obscures reality and the reality of mind and what this is, is all of our dreams, our mental events, our wishing things were otherwise, our fears, our hopes, our plans, all these things, they are like uh, clouds that cover the sun, the sun being the sun of wisdom. In death, all those things subside and die, at least for a moment. And reality is revealed much more clearly than it is during our lives. It's because all the mental apparatus is stripped away bit by bit as we die. Until at, at some point, at a point, if you can recognize it, if you've experienced it in this lifetime, in your meditation practice, if you've been had it pointed out to you by a teacher, you will recognize it much more easily in death. So it's a really, it's a, a tremendous opportunity Uh, Pandav Rinpoche says, it is like a shift in the weather. He's talking about at the moment of death, the ultimate death. When the sky clears up, the dense coverings of clouds is gone, and suddenly we see the vast sky. At this moment, mind arrives directly at its own ground. It is just like coming home. And in fact, that moment is described one of the metaphors is they say it's like it's the mother-child moment. The child represents your practice. There's a little bit of artificiality in it. There's a little bit of self-consciousness in it. You're watching yourself. You know? <coughs> but the mother is the real thing. And at the moment of death, when everything is stripped away, it's like a child seeing its mother and leaping into the mother's lap. That can happen if we've prepared. And how do we prepare? By meditating, by developing the mind of meditation, of coming present, of resting in awareness in this present moment, of appreciating the beauty and the vividness of this world. Hmm. So he says, so dying is not just an experience of physical suffering and mental agony. It can be an experience of clarity and ease and ultimate truth if we've prepared. Yogis and yoginis are not afraid of death. Hmm. And of course, if you have already achieved enlightenment, meaning you've woken up and you're just resting in this ultimate clarity, this bardo of dying doesn't even exist. It's not really there's no nothing to die because you're no longer identified as a self. There's just awareness of whatever is happening. So he says the point is to be ready. If we're still lost in dreams, our minds are so overwhelmed by our clinging and grasping that we miss the whole thing. We're saying, no, 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 I don't want this. He says, the cure is to become habituated to the practice of mindfulness and awareness. We need to come back to it always in every situation, not just when we are on the meditation cushion. So as we walk down the street through the moments of our lives, anybody want to say anything in any moment? Just jump in. I don't want to. Then you. Um, there are three capacities of practitioners, and we're not going to bother with that too much. Um, those who are very advanced just go through this utterly easily. Um, middling practitioners, and in fact, there are some great practitioners, and they they achieve what's called the rainbow body. So when you read about the rainbow body, there are very few people who ever achieve that. Um, it's um, people who are utterly, completely enlightened, even before, way before they die. And uh, people like Padmasambhava, to whom we do that chant, you know, the seven line supplication, you who have realized 
the Dharma Tav, what is? Um, no, that isn't that. Sorry, it's um, in the northwest of the land of Vidyana on a blooming lotus flower. You know, that's to chant of Padmakara, which is another name for Pamasambhava. And he achieved the rainbow body. And then there are middling practitioners, and the middling is pretty darn good. They, um, they're enlightened people, and, um, but they leave bodies behind and um, they go into death cheerfully. And then there are lesser practitioners, uh, those who possess strong realization of the nature of mind, and they go through the experiences of this bardo, and for them the instructions of Pamasambhava, which is basically the instructions are come present, are really crucial. Yeah. So we prepare ourselves by becoming familiar with the stages of death so that we recognize them when they arise. We're not freaked out. Um, and we're going to go through this faster. This is this chapter in the book, uh, Mind Beyond Death. And I think tonight we'll just go through the dissolution of the physical body, what's called the coarse body, this thing here, and um, which is comprised of the five elements, um, the four physical elements and then space. So earth, water, fire, wind, and space. And then there's the really the fifth element that's beyond that is uh, consciousness itself. And that's what we're going to talk about perhaps next time. Um, and these, this idea of uh, that the body and the world are made up of these elements, earth, water, fire, uh, wind, and space, it sounds very primitive. It sounds sort of like um, you know, primitive religion. But really, it's just another way of talking about, um, almost metaphorically, poetically, about what we experience. So the earth is this solid, uh, heavy quality of all of this. And uh, fire is the quality of heat. And not literally heat, uh, it could be the quality of color. You know, so um, the black and this sweater, uh, the green of Lane's shirt. Uh, you know, nobody's wearing red, but we could be. There are some red, reddish cushions over there. All of these things are the quality of fire, the way things communicate <coughs> their qualities to us. The quality of um, water has to do with literally fluidity, um, that there's fluid in our bodies, um, that there's, we're drinking water, uh, it's everywhere, and things move with fluidity. Even the air does. And then the quality of air has to do with air, that air rushes and moves and blows and uh, moves things around. And these are different aspects of the, f the world that we experience. And as we die, um, these things begin to fall away. Um, so the first thing that happens is when we can begin to die, we contract the condition that's going to kill us. It might be uh, an illness. Um, if you die suddenly, as David did, by asphyxiation probably, uh, my friend David in the fire, um, then all of it happens very fast. But you, it can happen over years. Uh, I have uh, someone I love who's been dying of, uh, from breast cancer for 24 years, the last seven, stage four. Right. Contrast that with David, uh, my friend, dying in minutes in his house in a fire. And But these processes all take place. They just collapse uh, with shorter time duration. They happen much faster. Yeah. 
so the um, as each one of these we go go through these stages so as each stage the element first increases in its qualities and then decreases and dissolves so for instance um, earth is the first and when we begin to die we begin we lose the strength to move our body we become very heavy the earth quality and um, uh, there are three qualities, the three ways that this is described, the outer signs, the inner signs, and the secret signs. Um, the outer sign is that the, as the earth element dissolves, we experience a loss of physical strength and agility. And mentally, our perceptions become less clear. Um, in as water begins to dissolve, and earth dissolves into water, and then as water dissolves, we experience um, a wateriness and we lose c the ability to, uh, you know, hold, uh, to stay continent. We become incontinent and we might urinate, you know, and defecate. And uh, we, f we begin to feel that we're, we're floating in our bodily liquids. And then we begin to become very dry. Our eyes become dry. Our mouth becomes dry. We might want water, you know, someone to give us water. In the third stage, the fire element dissolves, and we begin to feel very hot at first, like we're feverish, and uh, we need to be cooled. But then, as it progresses, we begin to become cold, and our limbs uh, lose their circulation, and our and extremities actually become cold. And in the fourth stage, um, as the wind begins to dissipate, uh, at first uh, we are breathing very rapidly and uh, perhaps even gasping for breath. And then our breath begins to rattle and we begin to become uh, much more hardly breathing at all. There are secret signs that accompany each of these and these are like visions that we, that we have. Um, this goes on here, let's see. There's a, all of this is related to different consciousnesses. So as uh, Earth dissolves, your vision becomes uh, affected and you begin to see less. As uh, water dissolves, hearing goes. Vision is the first to go. Um, and then hearing is the next. And after hearing, smell and taste begin to go, and then bodily sensation uh, begins to go as each stage. Hmm? Oh, Mike? Okay. By the way, the Dalai Lama, I read some years ago, said that he contemplated these stages every day so that he would be at ease as he went through them. Interesting. And then there are the secret signs. Um, in the um, first dissolution of Earth, uh, the secret sign is that we see a mirage. We have the world appears to us like a mirage, dreamlike. Um, and it's important to notice these, that you notice them and sort of rest in them. You don't reject them. In the st second stage where water is dissolving into fire, uh, the secret sign is that you see smoke, clouds, or steam. It's less solid than the previous, the mirage, less tangible and real. In the third dissolution, fire into wind, uh, the smell consciousness goes um, and there are wisdoms that dissolve here which are really intelligences. So in the first dissolution you lo lose the ability to intellect, intellectualize. 
uh, which means to be able to see how things are put together and come apart. In the second, um, you lose the wisdom of equanimity, of being able to just rest calmly. In the third, of fire into wind, uh, you lose the wisdom uh, that appreciates how things present, how you know the, the way in which they present to you. It's, it's surface appearances. And the secret sign, what is the secret sign? Is that you see sparks of light like fireflies. Um, this is the luminous aspect of the world sort of sparking up and uh, appearing to you almost like sparks of light. Flashes of luminosity are on and off like fireflies blinking. And then in the fourth one, wind into consciousness. Each one of these is connected with a chakra as well here that is dissolving, un 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 coming apart. The nadis, the channels are loosening and, and uh, untying. And taste and touch uh, disappear. And um, the ability to accomplish anything, that's a, a wisdom. Uh, the ability to even do anything, mentally or physically, is disappearing. The inner sign is that our minds become extremely confused and unstable, increasingly unclear. We begin to hallucinate. Um, and uh, the secret sign is a brightly shining torch or lamp, which is actually prefiguring or sort of, uh, what's the word I want to sending a, a message for the arising of the ground luminosity. Remember I talked about how when, it, when all of this dissolves, you see this clear, open state of mind, which is here all the time. It's just co covered over by thought. And this, oh, this torch, this feeling of uh, seeing a torch or lamp portends that. It sort of prefigures it. He says it is very important to attend to and rest in these secret signs when they arise. Um, it is important not to get disoriented or lost uh, in the sensations of, of the um, falling away of your faculties. So I think I'll stop there. And we can have a discussion if you like. You know, we all tend to live our lives, speaking for myself, as though it's going to go on forever. We can hardly imagine it ceasing. There's a, the four reminders which you will do if you start to do pr your nundro practice. In fact, nundro means preparation. You do nundro practice to prepare for, uh, for Vajrayana practice, more advanced practice. The nundro itself is quite profound. And there's the outer nundro, and there's the inner or more profound nundro. The outer nundro consists of the four contemplations. They are written in different ways. I memorize them in a particular way. I'll just recite them. Joyful to have such a human birth. Difficult to find, free and well favored. And what this means is that it's wonderful to be born a human being with all your faculties, able to see, hear, taste, touch, all of it, ambulate, move through the world, because it's a tremendous opportunity to come alive and enjoy your life, enjoy one's life, to wake up. Usually we're so lost in complaint and sorrow of one kind or another. And really the opportunity is to wake up to the beauty of this life in this world which we do in flashes, right? We see your child and it just opens your heart, you know, and things like that do that. A beautiful day, you step out and you go, ah. You know, it's, you see the sun, it opens your heart. We're being enjoined to do that 
all the time. So joyful to have such a human birth. Difficult to find, free and well favored. Now this is the idea, you can accept it or not, that we've had multiple, multiple lives. And you've been reborn in the past as an animal, as a hell being, as a god, none of which can tread the path to enlightenment. Only human beings can, and there's, there's reasons for that. The simplest reason is that only human beings have the optimal mixture of pain and pleasure. They've got enough release from suffering that you can actually tread the spiritual path. You know, hell beings can't because they're so suffering so intensely that that's all they can think about. And you have enough suffering that you're motivated to tread the path. Gods don't because <laughs> they're absorbed in pleasure. What do they care about spirituality? They're just having a great time enjoying all the pleasures. That's what it means to be a god. So only humans, so joyful to have such a human birth. They say that, <laughs> you'll like this one, here's the likelihood of being born a human being. If there were a tortoise in the ocean and this tortoise came up every 100 years for air and there was a, the yoke of an ox, you know, they yoked it to a plow floating in the ocean. And if that tortoise, as it rose then in that 100 year interval to get air, put its head through that yoke that was floating in the sea, that's the likelihood of being reborn a <laughs> human being. <laughs> 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 Take it for what you will. I just think it's really funny. Uh, that's the first reminder. Difficult to find, free and well favored. But death is real. That's the second reminder. Comes without warning. For Romy, for David, wow. This body will be a corpse. This body will be a corpse even when you know it's coming. My father, who was dying, took him five years to die from multiple myeloma. His last words were, I never thought it would be like this. And then he died. I had a good friend, Robin Kornman. He was a fellow Dharma practitioner, scholar, translator, taught at the um, University of Minneapolis, I think. Princeton PhD, and he discovered uh, that he was dying of um, mesoepithelioma. I think that's what it's called. It's a form of cancer that you get. It attacks the lining around your stomach, and you get it from exposure to asbestos. Robin had helped his father uh, when he was a boy remove asbestos from schools. He was given four years to live. Uh, the day he died, he had a friend who was a doctor, and she was his student as well, studied Sanskrit and Tibetan with him. And um, they went, uh, she took him to his uh, piano lesson. He decided to learn how to play the piano. And he took the lesson, seemed in good spirits, stood up, and died. Death is real, comes without warning. Certainly came without warning for my friend David Gurevich. And for Romy, Muhammad. And uh, so, there you have it. Um, <laughs> I feel like I've been steeped in this from, the, from teaching it for these, all these weeks, and then these two meaningful deaths of good friends. Amazing, huh? So, we could have a discussion if I haven't just utterly... <laughs> two, more two reminders? You want the last two? Um, unalterable are the laws of karma. Cause and effect cannot be escaped. And that's true as long 
as you're unenlightened, as long as you believe in the existence of a self and other, as long as we operate in this dualistic manner, then we are bound by the karmic chain. The only way to become free of it is to move into the world of enlightenment in which I and other no longer exist, or myths. And the last reminder is samsara. <laughs> That's confusion and suffering, samsara. The cyclic round of constant death, rebirth, is an ocean of suffering unendurable, unbearably intense. That's the fourth reminder. And I remember Trungpa Rinpoche saying he would never admit that he was enlightened if people would ask him and he would just blow it off. But he did say one time, he said, if you could only know what the alternative is you know, to the suffering that you're experiencing, he said, you wouldn't waste a second. And basically the idea is that we're so immersed in suffering, we have no idea of how bad it actually is. <laughs> Do you think that's funny? No, <laughs> no, it's not funny. I think it's funny. It's just macabre. Hmm? No, he was talking about, he was talking about samsara. You know, I'm sorry, you know, if you we're so immersed in confusion and suffering we, without seeing what the alternative is, you know, you don't really realize that it could be different, so much better. We just think, yeah, I'd like a little more sugar in my coffee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I really found the chapter really interesting, but a red flag went up for me at one point. Uh, that was the uh, the rainbow body. Rainbow body? Yeah. It struck me as do dogma. Dogma. It struck me as like Christ walking on water or Muhammad flying on a horse. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that? Um, I don't... It, it's really probably beyond me, but... Um, I put it in the same class uh, as the idea of tulkus, you know, uh, that enlightened people can come back uh, to samsara out of compassion for sentient beings to help them achieve enlightenment. And they can come back again and again and again. So Trungpa Rinpoche was the 11th return of the Trungpas, Trungpa Tulku. The Dalai Lama is the 14th. The Karmapa is the 17th, come back 17 times. And I put it in the same league. I mean, when they talk about people who've had the rainbow body, for instance, uh, Vimala Mitra, um, who was a great perfection practitioner, in fact, teacher. He's one of the two most important teachers of Dzogchen, the great perfection. Uh, went to Tibet in the 8th century, and when he passed, Supposedly, you know, he um, went in some form to a mountain in China that he, where he had lived before called Five Peaked Mountain, Wu Tai Shan in uh, Chinese. And he lives there today and comes back every 100 years. In some form, he takes birth again to make sure that the great perfection, the Dzogchen teachings, haven't disappeared, fallen into whatever. And, um, and then they say that Padmasambhava, who also achieved the rainbow body, um, also lived in the 8th century and also brought the Dzogchen teachings to Tibet, lives on, on this island called Chamara. You know, this is in the old geography, the Hindu-Tibetan geography. We live on Jambudvipa, and Jambudvipa is surrounded by a, a number of islands, about eight, I think, four bigger and smaller. One of them is Chamara, 
And on Chamra, that's where Padmasambhava lives, lives, abides, let's say. And when we do the seven line supplication, we are calling him to come to us. But what we're really calling when we do the seven line supplication is our own awakened nature, which is there. We are invoking it. And we are invoking the beauty of that awakened mind. And I think it's probably the same, you know, for um, Vimala Mitra and other people who that we think have achieved the rainbow body, that they represent different aspects, different manifestations of awakened mind that we can appreciate and inhabit and become. That's the way I take it. But I'd sure like to meet them. <laughs> Maybe, who knows? In answer to uh, Joe's question, um, there are more recent examples of uh, masters who have achieved a rainbow body that have been um, documented photographically, and you can find them online. Um, I, I, it's, it's not a subject I, 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 I understand. I don't quite understand um, the connection between you know such a high level of realization and the dissolution of a body. Um, but supposedly there, there are examples that you could view. Yeah, but it does, you know, it, it definitely enters into the realm, to me, of superstition. And, um, it, you know, there's always that cross. I mean, the most, you know, subtle form of Buddhism has, is really the kind that we've learned here. It's, it's communicated by people like Trungpa Rinpoche and, and others, the Dalai Lama. But there are Tibetan Buddhists who pray to Tara and uh, other deities as though they actually exist like Jesus, you know? And there's a, so there's a whole range of, um, of um, practice and understanding. And we have the what appeals to us and makes sense to us and other people uh, have what appeals and makes sense to them. So, um, next month my father turns 92, and his body is heavy and slow, and has been slowing down for many years now. His intellect is not what it once was, not even close. He suffers from incontinence. He even hallucinates occasionally. In fact, that when he called before we were talking, he had just had a hallucination. So, how do you distinguish between just sort of natural aging and decay of the you know, the caused by the aging process, you know, as opposed to the, the death bardo, or are there just parallels that are similar, or is he in the death bardo? He may well be in the death bardo. Sometimes I wonder, you know, if um, as we age, we aren't actually beginning at the edges of the, of the bardo of death. I mean, uh, you know, I look at myself, I was used to be an athlete, did every, everything, you know, ski, ran, technical rock climber, race bicycles, you name it. And now, <laughs> I've had both shoulders and both hips replaced. I mean, I'm slow and way down. <laughs> and it's that thing, earth, heaviness. And I just wonder, is this, could this be seen as being the beginning of the dissolution of earth into water? You know? Yeah. But, you know, for many people, it's just much more gradual. But then for other people, it just happens, you know, in a finger snap, like, like my friend David dying from that fire, or Romy, in of the flu in, uh, what is it, three days. And then she was gone. I, we thought it was so extraordinary, and now I've heard that people actually can <laughs> die of the flu. That it's not un that uncommon. So, yes, I think it's entirely possible that's my take, but I've never heard that from a teacher, so, but that's, I think it's reasonable. Yeah. The death could just be a long, slow deterioration, and then it accelerates. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, for some reason, reason, I always thought that um, death in sleep was the ideal death 
because like you die in peace but now i understand your point that's like it's you wake up and it's you're somewhere else and you're in confusion um but alternatively can there be a way uh that like in sleep you mindfully go to this like death uh transition to the death yes yes and these are practices that um, we're not trained in. And they have to do with dream yoga and working with the dream state and the sleep state, uh, lucid dreaming. And there are people who are teaching this right now um, here in New York. And um, what's his name? Oh, I've forgotten if I met this fellow. He gave a talk at uh, recently, American. Uh, has been studying this with a Tibetan who, who's passed, uh, the Tibetan passed, but he's um, authorized to teach dream yoga. Uh, Katz, thank you. His name is Katz. Michael Katz, I think. I think so, too. And um, I've got a book by him. It looks quite good. And, um, and there's another fellow um, in Colorado uh, whose name is Andrew Holacek, who has been studying this for a long time, and he teaches it. Um, lucid dreaming, which means the first step is that you can be asleep and know you're dreaming, and then the ability to control your dreams. One of the most common things, which I, I, I thought for years, you know, I've always thought, I can't do that, control my dreams, much less know that I'm dreaming. Two nights ago, I, I woke up and realized that I'd been flying in my dream. <laughs> there it was. And we've all done that you know, occasionally. Uh, no? You haven't? <laughs> Go figure. So, yes, it's an art and a, a thing that to be practiced. You can. We can we could do that. There's a lot of practices there that are connected with death that we haven't done here practice of POA, which is ejection of consciousness from your body at the moment of death. Um, you practice it in this life, but you don't actually do it. Because if you did, you'd kill yourself, <laughs> supposedly. <laughs> you'd eject your consciousness from your body. Yeah. And do you do it when you think you're ready to step out of this life? Or is it like a particular time when people do it? Do which? Poa? Yeah. Um, you practice it now in preparation for death. And you don't actually do poa. Poa means ejection of consciousness from the body. But you come close. So you imagine that you've got, you're ejecting from the top of your head, and you imagine you've got a, I forget what it is, something up there that's blocking. You know, that the Buddha is, is who is up there that you're going to eject your consciousness into has his feet on the top of your head, so you can't actually do it. You don't want to do it <laughs> during this life, but you can practice it. Maurice's question is, um, how do you know when it's time to actually do so? I think um, when you've got a, a reasonably good understanding, which I think you do, of meditation and of the basic point of the Dharma, so that it isn't some kind of a gimmick um, that you're trying to learn some kind of exotic um, entertainment. But you're actually preparing for death. Anybody else? Well, next week we'll finish the part of dying and uh, talk about the dissolution of the mental state. Okay. So we can end. We should dedicate the merit to all sentient beings. This is so important. The development of compassion um, that we have compassion for others. And um, we're going to start doing 
a bit of Tonglen, five minutes of Tonglen, uh, if it's okay with everybody. Yeah. In the beginning, before we start the lecture, in the, in the during the meditation practice. Sorry. 